Hello, bootstrappers. Hello, bootstrappers. Hello, bootstrappers. Now, describe to people the kind of products that you've come out with, because they may not be aware of your website and, and what you guys do. We make all natural, all organic, non-toxic, just about anything you could think of non-bad. Everything that we use in our products are all, you know, they're all natural, they're eco-friendly, they're sustainable, all the way to our packaging. Everything is all about being healthy, providing healthy alternatives, and being conscious of the environment. I guess that's something that I was really a big proponent of for, for as long as I can remember, and I'm, I'm old. But then when I started having kids, I realized, you know, one of these days, I'm, I'm going to leave this place to them. And I want to leave it a better place. And I want them to have that same passion to keep it a better place and then leave it a better place for their generations. So that was a lot of the, you know, originally it was just, I just wanted alternatives because the FDA doesn't regulate what chemicals people can put in any product, any household product. And so somebody can stamp, like, this is green on their product. And it's really not. If you go and you start looking at their chemo, you know, looking at their ingredients. I wanted products where, like, somebody could look at the product and, like, read the ingredients and be like, I know what every one of those things is. I don't need to go get a chemistry degree to know what's in this product. Yeah. And that's yeah. how it started. And it just kind of, just kind of snowballed what, really fast. What, what was your first product? What did you start with? My very first product, I was actually two. It was a hand sanitizer and a soap. To this day, that soap and that hand sanitizer are two of our top selling products. I have this like secret blend that I put in my hand sanitizer and everyone, everyone who has bought it, I mean, I can't say everyone because a lot of people, but the feedback on that one is, I don't know what you do to this, but I have to have six more bottles. And we have customers that will buy like 10 bottles at a time. Does it smell good? Is it good on the hands? What, what makes it different? Well, there's a lot of things that make it different, but then I have a couple of little secret ingredients that are in there. I use 100% organic, 200% cane alcohol. So it's like stronger than anything. It's 200% alcohol, but it's non-toxic. I use all essential oils. I use an all natural emulsifier. Usually I use like vitamin E and those as my emulsifier. And then I add a couple of little secret things in there. So like when you spray it on your hands, it doesn't make your hands sticky and it doesn't dry them out. It actually moisturizes them. That like hand sanitizer bug spray, our bug spray is epic. Like our disinfecting cleaning supplies. It's, we can't, it's just crazy how many people want them. When, when did you start? January of last year of 2019. Last year, it was like okay, this is a great business. I'm making six figures. I can support my family very comfortably. What a great idea this is. And that's where I made all of my mistakes. Cause I, you know, I thought this will just be a great business that I can have and still be at home with my kids, have flexibility, be creative. And then 2020 happened. And I was like, oh, we may not like this company may not make it because we're boutique, we're different. And we ended up boosting in sales because we had natural arts alternatives to what everybody was wanting to get their hands on. And we had introduced what I call our premium products that my daughter makes, my mom makes that you can't get anywhere else. And they're one of a kind. And those did really well. So we didn't see that dive from COVID. We actually did well. Well, it was a good year to have hand sanitizers. That's for sure. Right. You know, you know what my biggest problem was not getting the ingredients. It was getting the bottles because you have to use very specific bottles because essential oils at, over time will break plastic down. So like putting essential oils and things, you really have to be careful. If you put it in a plastic, it has to be like a non-PETA plastic. And then it has to also have certain components in it so that it can hold up to the essential oils. So most of the time we use glass and just getting bottles was just out of control. And the premium that I paid a few times to fill orders to get bottles was just, it was wild. That was where we definitely saw the, the hit of like people were bottling their own hand sanitizer. So it, it, it was different for sure. If you could just kind of share with us, you know, the journey that you're on, the business that you started and kind of where you're at right now. The way it all happened was very organic. It was something that I just initially started to kind of 
supplement income, I guess, then it gained traction really fast. And then when we got tweeted by Jenny McCarthy, it was just like, boom, overnight. I've had so many people ask me, what did you pay or what, you know, how did you get that? How did you get it? I didn't. It was super organic again. When all that happened and I realized like, oh my gosh, like I can't be a one man show anymore because we have to go from filling 10 bottles of orders to 10,000 bottles of orders really fast. And I made some real detrimental mistakes along the way that having started this journey of seeking out an investor and, you know, a partner and co-founder and all these different things that I think a lot of people make because they don't anticipate that like push or that where you have that moment of it just goes crazy. And so that's one of the things I've learned. Every investor is different. You know, I've spoken with two different investors now. One of them was all about the personal story. Where did it start? Why is it so important to you? And then one of them was like, I don't care anything about your personal story. Your, Show your me company the is completely the numbers. separate. And I'm like, oh, okay. But it's one of those things that I wasn't so naive to think that it's like Shark Tank where you send out a pitch deck and somebody calls you and says, I'll give you $500,000 today. It's crazy when you decide to kind of take this journey when you realize like, okay, I know what I'm good at and what I'm not good at. So I need to delegate what I'm not good at. I need to find somebody who's good at it. It's just crazy to realize how naive we really are when we want to start like a real business where it's, there's infrastructure and there's all these different things that go into it. It was humbling at the least because I've always been really good at business. And when I put my mind to something, I'm successful at it and I don't fail and so, you know, for people to be like, oh, we need to see your pitch deck. What is that? And, you know, here I go, you know, Google University. Normal, pitch deck. What is it? normal Americans don't have pitch decks. It's just purely a tech startup. We used to have business plans when I was, when I first started off and now it's just the pitch deck. That was what I did first was I wrote a business plan because I had been in real estate for years and then I was in civil litigation for years and granted they're not businesses. But I mean, I know like when you want to start something and you want it to be successful, you have to put it put it to paper and you have to have like steps. Like these are the steps I want to take and this is where I want to go and this is how I need to get there. And so my original business plan was super rudimentary and it was really just, and I kept the notebook and I'll probably keep it forever. It was just a spiral notebook and it was just ideas and thoughts and Lots of different colored inks going to different directions so that I could, you know, keep that idea. It was one of the most overwhelming things that I've ever dealt with to be like, okay, like I have 20 seconds to catch someone's attention. You said in 2019 that there were a couple of like, like times when that, that's when you got to experience all, all your first round of mistakes, right? And yes. the, so the, the channel that we have, Bootstrap Revolution, is really designed for bootstrappers to help share their journey so that other bootstrappers can learn from it. What, uh, is there anything about your journey in 2019 and what you learned and the mistakes that would be valuable to share? Yes. From the very beginning of your project, whatever it is, treat it like it's a real, real business. Like, like it's a fortune 500 corporation. My big mistakes that I would be funded and be off to the races right now if I hadn't made that I look back and be like, oh, whenever I would get orders, I would put it into my personal bank account, pay for supplies out of my personal bank account. I didn't even go get a sole proprietorship on it. It was just like friends and family and a few outside customers from word of mouth and it gained traction that way. What I did wrong was I didn't treat it like it was its own business from the beginning, I was just like, oh yeah, this is a great business, but it really wasn't a business. It was really a hobby at that point because I hadn't taken the proper steps to make it a business. If you make mistakes like that, you don't have any, when you go to somebody and say, Hey, I need an investment. I need to move this into a much bigger scale. They want proof that like that you've done it and that, that there is a demand there, that there is a market there. And when you don't keep like the most detailed books, like when they ask you really basic questions and you have to sit back and think, or you don't know, you just instantly get put to the back of the pile because there are people that from the beginning, their goal was like, 
this is going to be a fortune 500. I'm going to exit at, you know, a million, a billion dollars in five years. And they started it out that way. And had I known what it was going to do and what I could have done with it, I would have treated it so different from the very beginning. I mean, I've been told, you know, to my face, like I, w- I would invest in you in a second, but there's no real data. It's yeah, you deposited it into your checking account and yeah, you walked away with six figures, but you don't know if you were in the red or in the black, you don't really know. And I'm like, well, I know I was never broke. So, but I mean, it's one of those things that like, I have no proof. I know what my profit margins are. You know, I, I know those basic things, but there are so many questions that you get asked along the way that if you just aren't paying attention to that business in every way, <clears throat> you know, to me, it was my baby and I love it. Like it's my baby and I treat it like it's my baby, but I didn't treat it with the professional respect that it Ty- needed. Typically, so- when I start up a, any kind of business, I set up a separate bank account and I have a separate credit card and I run everything through that and I run it all through the bank account. So that it floats up. And I'm like you, like I've got one bunker consulting. I'm never going to sell it, but it compartmentalizes it to where you can track it. And then if you ever do, the records are there to be able to go out and show someone. And yeah. It's an easy thing to forget. And I only do it after having started many, many, many things and just going, oh, my God, I can't keep track of it all. That would be if, if anybody ever came to me and said, what is the best business advice you could give me if I want to be big one day? I would tell them absolutely treat that business like it is own person for every detail you put into that product, put that much detail into your banking and your accounting and knowing what, you know, what makes the most profit, what sells best at what certain times of year. And I wish I could go back to myself 18 months ago and be like, Hey, in 18 months, Jenny McCarthy's going to tweet you and you're going to have celebrities that are waiting for your product and you're not going to be able to give it to them unless you get your, you know what together. I wish I would have known. I mean, but you know, hindsight's always 2020. And so now you, now it's like you take the hard road now and you don't have that just, okay, let's do it. Along the journey, you're going to solve for different problems, right? And right now the problem is, you know, you have more demand than capacity to, to fulfill. Is that the current Yes. Yes. And that's, that's another thing that I would tell anybody taking this journey on, you have to prepare yourself. You have to believe so much in your product and so much in yourself that you have to believe it's going to take off at some point. Just, you have to believe it just in your head. Always think this is going to take off one day and it's, we're going sky's the limit because if you don't, and you don't prepare yourself the whole way along the way, when that happens, you're just dead in the water and you're not viable to most investors. Every once in a while, you'll find some maverick. And that's really my only hope at this point. You know, you'll find some maverick investor that's like, I love your idea. I love your product. I love you. I love the concept. Let's make this happen. But most of them, it's, it's numbers. And if the numbers don't make sense and the numbers don't add up, next. That's what I would tell anybody is just believe so hard that you're going to have that moment, that, you know, lightning in a bottle moment and be prepared because if you're not. Most you're- entrepreneurs have the opposite problem. They believe it so hard that they forget to, uh, to have a product that actually works. I mean, it's funny. There are many issues as you grow a business. The first issue is usually nobody cares. And so most, most startups die because no one ever finds out or cares about what the person's doing. Then if you're lucky, and, and I was lucky, Eva was lucky, and it sounds like you're getting lucky, you have that demand take off. And then you hit the scaling issue, which your, your business is going well enough that you don't have enough time and energy to do everything. But it's not going well enough that you can hire all these people to do it for you. And right. So you're stuck in, in that in-between area where a lot of businesses die. I mean, the ones that make it past the no demand will die in that first jump in demand because they can't meet it. That's what's been crazy with my business was we had a very consistent demand and we have a very loyal customer base. Like our customer uh, retention rate is so amazing. We're like up in the 80 percentile. Once we get a customer, they stay a customer. 
I would say almost half of our customer base orders at least once a month. You know, one thing about our products is they don't have a long shelf life. Like you can't just go stick it on your shelf and not use it because they're all naturals. They don't go bad in a week, but we produce in smaller, ba- you know, smaller sizes so that they're consumable a lot faster and they don't end up going bad on our, on our customers. Realizing that you've hit that spot where it's like, okay, people love the product. Jenny McCarthy obviously loves the product. And then you get that, that boost. I can't sit at my dining room table and fill, you know, $17,000 worth of orders. You know, I can barely get my kids to help me slap stickers on it. But for me, production is me. It's, I make the products, I package the products, I label the products, then I pack them up all nice and neat and pretty to be shipped off. And so it's one whole day is packaging. One whole day is my dining room table literally is just I have tags of every customer's name and their box and I start boxing. And when I realized like, I have to scale this, I have to, I have to go to someone that I can say, I need 5,000 bottles of hand sanitizer in a week. And they can be like, not a problem. And that was where it got really scary. And I got a little bit arrogant and I thought, okay, well, you know, I have celebrity endorsement. I have celebrities that want my products that are waiting for them. And I thought, Who wouldn't want to jump on this? Like this thing's going, this train's just going off the rails. And then I realized there's a lot more to it. It's not just, oh, I had this, you know, wonderful windfall. It's, you know, can you prove that if that windfall never happened again, would your company still be sustainable? Would you still be successful? That was like the hardest crow for me to eat. Oh, wait, I know I have that, but I made the mistakes that I can't prove that. You go to bed and you're just sick that night and think, I missed it by that much. Well, how much are you trying to raise at this current point in time? My original raise was 750000 because I wanted to scale it really fast. And I wanted, I met with this guy, Will, on launch team. Uh, everybody's heard of them. And he was really kind. And he was like, you know, we take on certain, so many projects a year. And he was like, we would love to take yours on. But of course you have to pay those people and it's expensive and they corporation in a box. They help you build your team. They know all the right people. They get you to, you know, they just basically GTM you really fast, but you have to have the money to do all of that. (laughs) And so that may be why they're so nice is because you're the customer. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I figured I'm like, "Mm, if you're going to be making 10 grand a month off of me, you're probably going to be really, really nice. Yes. But he was actually the one that told me, hey, your pitch deck sucks. Go fix it. And told me, you know, what was wrong with it. And I was like, thank you. Like, I appreciate that because um, I didn't know. I had no idea. It was terrible the first time. That's what I originally was like, let me sit down and do the numbers because digital marketing is so expensive and finding people who are good at it is even more expensive. And I, another lesson I learned was, I was referred by my financial advisor to this web guy because I built my website myself. The web guy. The web guy. I built my website myself, which if y'all could talk to my children, they would tell you, I can barely work my iPhone. I constantly have to come get my children and be like, fix this, change the TV channel. My financial advisor said, you know, this guy works in my building and he's done some work for me before. I'm not technologically inclined in any fashion. It took me almost a month to build that website. It, it was just toiling away. And when I say almost a month, I mean seven o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock at night and just nonstop. And so I got it built. Everybody complimented me on it. I, I was really proud of it. And it. But it just had these weird little quirks that like if you got on it on, you know, because like I work on a 27 inch Mac. So it looked great on my Mac and on my on my screen, but then I got on it on my son's laptop and he has this, you know, Alienware that's smaller and it's di- different and it was all weird and the buttons weren't in the right place. And so, you know, he's like, I have this web guy, you know, he said he can fix your website and make it more user friendly. He started working on it and immediately I was like, nope, I don't like that. No, nope, I don't like that. Like, and we went straight to like cheesy and cliche and he had put something on there about the hand sanitizers and the disinfecting sprays and said something about COVID-19. I don't want anything on there about COVID-19. We're not using scare tactics to get customers. We want to get customers because they feel warm and fuzzy about the products, not because we're scaring them into buying these products. And so we went back and forth a lot. And that was a lot of money that 
could have been. Fun to, isn't it fun to argue with someone you're paying to do something? It's a blast. Well, and it was just like, like you know, I kept saying, like, I just want to keep with the same same aesthetic as sure. I've always had. Like, just, the fluid design, not, just not, the not a redo. And it was just changing things constantly. And I'd go on the website and be like, oh my God, what have you done here? And I'd be like, go back and change it. And it ended up where I was just like, you know what? I'll do it myself. Just don't touch the website anymore. I'll do it myself. I'll take care of it. I learned a valuable lesson that even someone who has your best of intentions in mind, you know, like my financial advisor, he's, he doesn't want to see me lose money and get screwed over. Do your research. Don't well, ever. He's never built a consumer product on the web. What would he know what a good web designer? It's a typical mistake to make in that. It's not true. I mean, we, we built our stuff from the ground up way back when it was really hard. And so I, I totally know what you're talking about. Learning how to pick a good vendor for this kind of stuff is very crook. I guess, Eva, you hired Scott sometimes from the outside yeah. to help with stuff, but we knew like he was a known quantity. One of the things that we learned, I learned here is a distinction between, hey, you have a need to elevate this aspect and the recommendation. Because some a lot of times people will say, hey, you really need to improve your website and they want to also give you a solution so they may recommend a, a person but but they're, they're really two different things one is the website needs elevation there's still how, how do you vet the vendor i mean that was one thing that I, I i learned and i was like i should know this from real estate like i was in real estate for a long time and i was really successful and like i didn't take anybody's word you know if they said hey this foundation guy is really good i'd be like okay let me talk to some people he's done some work for. I want references. And so I think sometimes as an entrepreneur, you get caught up in the, yes, I want everything about my product to be the best. And you don't stop and take that moment to be like, okay, did I do my due diligence with this person? Did I vet them properly and make sure that, you know, I got references? Have I seen their portfolio? Have I seen their work? We never butted heads. He was always very sweet about it. I was more of the this is my baby, like stop screwing it up. He's, you know, he did web ads. And so I had, you know, a limited budget and I said, let's do some Instagram, Facebook. And, you know, he told me like, oh, you're not even on Google. You don't have any backlinks. You need this, you need that. I'm like, can you do all of that? Cause I don't even know what that is. And he was like, yes, of course. And come to find out a week ago, I was talking to an investor, the, the Marine, and he's like, you realize you're not even on Google, right? Like you don't have any backlinks. There's no SEO. And I was like, that's great. Cause I paid for that for like four months. It was kind of one of those like, Oh, moments where, but then I can't really be mad at him. I have to be mad at myself. Didn't well, do my due diligence. And it cost me a huge red flag. If anyone's going to do web work or compute programming, work, any of that, they need to be a good listener. I mean, just start with that. If they can't actually hear what you're trying to communicate or stop you and say, I don't understand, it's never going to work. It's not a good fit. Well, and I'm one of those people, I'm real straight and to the point, and I value people's time and I expect them to value my time. And so I'm, I'm one of those, like, get to the point and let's see what we can do. Let's figure a solution. And I don't mince words. Like, I'm really... When I say something, like I say it in a way that my two-year-old could understand it. I don't talk down to people, but I'm very specific. I don't like the the hue of purple you're using on that one button because we don't have purple on the website. Like I'm that specific. And that was really maddening to me to be like, I'm a pretty articulate person. Like you can't possibly be mixing this up this bad. <laughs> and so it was just one of those where you look back and you say, lesson learned and money spent. Well, there's so many things that you pointed out that you don't know, right? Because there's so many things to learn. And, and one of the hardest things I think is to figure out what is the next step in each of these different areas. I want to celebrate you learned how to make your own website. Thank you. <laughs> that's huge. Like that's, that's huge. And, and there's like, there, like if, I, if I look at a lot of journeys, like there'll be like a dive in, okay, I can do it myself. It didn't quite work out and maybe like a over rebound to now I need to find an expert. And I think there's a middle ground where like, what is the most cost effective way for me to get to the next step versus over over solving and getting the mythical backlinks? What platform are you on? Wix. Wix. Okay. Yeah. And that was another thing he came to me and told me was like, we really need to port you over to Shopify. And I had originally 
started on Shopify, but it was a little bit too advanced for me. So I just went and found something that wasn't too advanced for me. And Wix was right at my level. I knew it needed to, I know, I know it needs to go to Shopify. Wix just isn't, it really isn't an e-commerce platform. It's great for other websites. I mean, it's great. I've used Wix before, you know, for like my real estate website and stuff like that, but e-commerce, it's just not heavy enough hitter for a strong e-commerce store. And so it does need to go to Shopify. What is it breaking down now? Does it look right on all the different screen sizes? It, it's as good as it can get. And I spent another probably two weeks of 16 hour days, just, I would get all of my kids to bring me their computers. You know, my daughter has a little Mac. My son has his Alienware. My other son has his MSI. I would get on my Mac. Like I would bring every computer in the house, in the room and my phone and I'd get their iPads and we would all get them all up and see which one wasn't tweaked right or whatever. There are websites that will show you what it looks like in different screen sizes, just FYI. Oh, well, well, that's great. I wish I would have known that. Just going forward, though, it, they make it, they'll, they'll go, and this is what it looks like here. This is what it looks like on an iPhone here. Well, we should remember to put that a link. I'll, I'll find a link to it. Yes, put, put a link there for all the people like me. Because <laughs> yeah. it's a common problem. Like this yeah. thing, I mean, that's our, our bug, bugaboo, and this will tell you how early in the game it was, was web TV. Web TV. <laughs> Was trying to get it to look right on web TV, which is no longer exist. Uh, I was like, "Wait, is this a new, is, is is this like the TikTok thing that my kids are no, always?" No, this is 1998, about? 1999. Oh, okay, okay, okay. A failed product, and we beat our heads against the wall for a couple of months trying to get it to look right. You're now looking for investment. Yes. Uh, what problem are you trying to solve with that? I need to scale, and I need to build an actual company around the brand now the brand has but does scale mean you need to buy in bulk from someone else or what what does scale mean what where does in all honesty i need to scale outside of the kitchen because i can't fill the amount of orders that come in and right now my biggest thing that like i lose sleep over it just it just i can't it makes me anxious our customer satisfaction is literally the most important thing to me outside of quality and having to tell these people they have to wait and just hoping that they stick around and they believe in the product enough that they'll wait is just torturous. I realized I had that moment. Okay, I can't do it in the kitchen anymore. Right, but, like, but getting a place and hiring one or two people doesn't take $750,000. So that, that seven fifty dollars must be for a different plan because you could literally scale times three by just hiring two more people. Now there's three of them. I've thought about outsourcing it to single moms or military moms, you know, people who need to supplement their income and, you know, they have kiddos at home. That is at some point a goal where I can provide jobs to people with special needs and people who are transitioning out of prison and immigrants that like people who just wouldn't get a square shot normally. And that's way down the road. But I'm just kind of at that point now where I'm like, this has to be done in mass quantity now. Because like we have, we have like, I think it's 9,000 orders of just hand sanitizer sitting there. And if it was me and three other people, we couldn't pump that out in two months. But you could double, you could triple. I mean, so there's don't be, be careful not to let the perfect become the enemy of the better. Right. Because if you find the capital, great, do it. But but you may not find the capital, or at least well, that's you- something that I think um, everybody who goes out to seek capital, you have to have you have to acknowledge and accept and be okay with the fact that you may have to accept less capital than you think you need or than you want, just to take that next little step. And that doesn't mean you're not going to get to where you want to go right that second. It just means you're taking a different step. And like, I, I kind of feel like I tell my kids all the time, all the time, you know, like whatever your dream is, chase it and I'll help you. I'll, I'll do whatever I can to make your dream come true. But you have to understand that at some point that dream is not going to go exactly the way you're picturing it in your mind. Like the way you've mapped it out, it's not going to go exactly that way. So you have to be prepared to pivot and 
U-turn and completely stop sometimes. But that's kind of what I've realized with go in with what you would ultimately perfect ending like to happen, but understand that's probably not going to happen and find the person who wants that for you in the end and is willing to take that journey with you. But you may have to take it A to B, B to C. And well, what's kept you from just hiring the first employee to help? I can't even order enough ingredients right now. I have spent all the capital I have to even order the amount of ingredients I need to fill 20 orders. I'm hearing a, a, a few, I'm hearing a few problems. I'm hearing a, a few solutions and it'd be, I think, valuable to, to sort them out a little bit. Uh, so one of the problems is that you know, there's a bottleneck with, with ingredients, the supply chain. One of them, like a big one, is that it's just you and it's you and your kitchen. And there's a little bit of an insanity to that. If that keeps going, <laughs> I, you know, right? If that keeps going, that's probably really not good. Uh, the third one is that you care really deeply about customer satisfaction. And so having people waiting is, is, a, is a problem for you. Um, yeah, I don't like that at all. That's one of those things that we should have three-day turnaround. Like with our soaps, those have to cure. Most of our customer, I'd say all of them up until now, have all been really understanding on that. Like if you order a soap that we don't have currently made, I've got to make it by hand. And so it's got to cure and it's, it's going to be a week before you get it. Two and three week waiting periods, that's just unacceptable to me because... Given the current model, I right. to put that in there right now and just kind of hold it for a second. And then the, you're looking for investment and the investment is a large amount of capital and, and it's being framed right now. Is this going to solve your problems? But it's really, you know, if you have that, that's like hitting for the fence. But if we, if we set that aside and, and if you get that, that's awesome. But in the meantime, you've still got these, these problems. Right. And, and one, of, one of them, if I'm looking at, you know, there's a wait list or there's a wait time. Well, what if there was an exclusive club or there was an exclusive club? They, because they paid a subscription, did get the guaranteed delivery with something that you know you can give. I actually love that concept, if I'm being honest, because I had already discussed doing like a subscription model quarterly. I, I said quarterly because I knew I couldn't possibly fill however many prescriptions in one month. So they couldn't get one every month, but quarterly, you know, seasonally. I love the idea of it. You know, I've done, I've been a subscriber to different ones and I'm like, I love this. And when the box comes, I'm all excited. And, and then there's a know, waiting like list in the club. Yeah. And you just have so a way they're not waiting for a product. They're waiting for access to the club and it mm -hmm. feels very different. I love that concept. I'm truly shocked that you even brought it up, Eva, because that may be exactly what needs to happen because what, what I had been envisioning in my head was having, you know, our products that scale and, you know, we have these, you know, take the SKUs way, way down, maybe 10 or 15 SKUs and scale those, you know, have a co-packer that sends, sends those. But we also have like what I was saying before, our premium products. And, you know, like my daughter, she makes these dish towels. We can't keep them in stock. People order them immediately because not one is the same. Not one is made with some specific pattern. And then my mom hand crochets these face scrubbies. We can't keep those in stock. And they're all unique, you know, every single one. And I had even spit fired and taken notes on it. And I thought, you know, what if we had like the scaled products that were easy to get quickly, you know, that. And then we have our premium products and we expand it just a little bit to a few more cool, unique products like that. And if you have to wait for it, you have to wait for it. Cause like people will wait three years for a Rolex to say, I waited three years for this and nobody else has it. If you can, if you can pivot the problem into a brand asset, like where it elevates the brand versus. I love this idea. I, like, I, I'm not there's joking. There's another experience. So, so you've got some products that you can consistently create and you can predict how much you can make. So you can yeah. limit the club on that. The other thing you can do for the premium products that come out occasionally, you can create a newsletter where whenever there's a, a new premium product, it, the announcement goes out to the newsletter and first come first serve. And then it's sold out. See, I so, love all of this because I have spoken to several people with this idea and they're like, nope, that'll never work. You can't scale yeah. it. And I'm like, it's not meant to be scaled. List. 
It's not meant mm-hmm. to be scale. Those products are meant to be the creme de la creme of the products. Like, it, but even your regular stuff at current your current capacity, you have a waiting list to even be able to put an order. Right. That way, no one's mad. They know they're not going to get it. And then when you go to raise money, you can say, "Look at this damn waiting list I have." Wouldn't you like to fund me fulfilling those people? I love where you're going with this because then you can say, here's my monthly sales. Here's the size of my waiting list. When I send out a notification, here's the amount we have. Here's how many people that come to the website to buy it. And here's how many additional people join the waiting list. I mean, you can monetize that. You can say, every time I send out this newsletter, here's the, here's the response rate. Right. I need to be able to fulfill this. I, I seriously love the idea. One of my biggest fears with with it was I don't ever want it to lose the magic that it has. That's one of the things our customers do tell me is it's they love how it's packaged. They love how personal it is. You know, it's not commercially produced. And I mean, obviously, I would have to outsource, which would be great to give other people an opportunity to make some extra money and be a part of this. I mean, I think that would be so cool. I, I just, I love the whole concept of it because I was seriously just, I was trying so hard to figure out like, how do I, how do I marry the two of them where we still have our products that people really like and we're able to deliver them. But then we also have our premium products that people really, really like, but they are willing to wait for because it's made by a 10 year old little girl that, you know, puts her little tag on there and you have her story and I mean, but you also need a way to regulate how many people get access to your normal stuff until your supply catches up. I can't just open it back up again because... And so a I, waiting list captures it without denying anyone the chance to buy it in the future, but without them going, where the hell is it? Yeah, and, right. And tech companies do this all the time. They'll, they'll take the first hundred people, put everyone else on a waiting list. And then as they get all the bugs worked out, they add more people. And then that gives you the chance to message in a gracious way. Really glad that you're interested in our products. You're only a waiting list. We'll, be, we'll let you know as soon as it opens up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, um, that's kind of what I've been doing is like, please don't leave. Like as soon as, as soon as we can, you know, we'll, we'll let you place your order. It was one of those things where you never thought that was going to happen. And the subscription revenue gets valued more by investors, by the way. Well, and that was really honestly something that I really wanted to introduce. It's on my pitch deck. Like I really wanted to introduce a a subscription service. The statistics on them are really great. I mean, they're really gaining traction year over year. I think eventually it's going to be such a norm for people to have those subscription services. And I, I had said, you know, let's do five to seven products in each box, something seasonal, you know, like a seasonal candle and a seasonal soap. And one of our easy to produce products. One of our like premium products can be done pretty easily, but I, I I love the concept of that, of making it exclusive. And that's what I really loved about the products that my mom and my daughter make is they're exclusive and people, as soon as I say they're available, they're gone. It rewards your long-term customers right now. Your first customers are getting pushed out by everyone else buying everything up. And if it were a club, they're already in the club. Yes. Getting it every month. So now they're not mad. Now they're not angry. And you're putting off all the new demand, but in a way that captures the value to be able to try to raise the money to be able to meet. That's been a worry of mine is, you know, I do have devoted customers that are waiting on their orders and they're, of course, so gracious about it because, you know, they're great customers. But at some point they're like, okay, this is ridiculous. Like either get it together or just not. I've gotten emails from these celebrities publicists being like, are you going to send them their box? And I'm like, yeah, soon. Just bear with me. Well, they're on the list. They're on the waiting list. You know what? We're trying to move them up, but we just don't, you know, there's not room yet. Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, it makes people. I don't know if I have the guts to say that to certain celebrities, but like, it's a great idea. That's been the thing is I'm just like, we're sitting on like the cusp of it, of real greatness. And I, I just was like, how do I solve this problem? And, you know, I had one investor tell me like, you're like premium products, just give those up, forget that. And he was like, and I was like, do you realize our profit margins are nice? Story, though. It's part of your brand story. It, it's part of the charm of what makes your brand, your brand. 
So don't listen to that kind of advice. Yeah, I was like, I'm not doing that. Like, you're crazy. Jenny McCarthy tweeted my daughter's napkins sure. and ordered those napkins. Yeah. That's a niche there that I haven't seen before. Like, you can go find all natural products online. I don't know how many you can find that are like made out of a kitchen. I'm sure there are all over Etsy. But ours is just, it's unique and it's different. And it took, it gained traction for that reason. You can't find like our little premium products where they have the special tag where she, she signs, let me show y'all. She signs every towel with her name. And then we put our logo on there. Oh, is that better? Oh, that's nice. Yeah. And then it comes with a tag and we know we wrap it up all nice and pretty. Like this is one she made for me. That's beautiful. But she hand dyes every single one. And then we were, you know, wrap it up all nice and pretty. And it's got her tag on there with her story on the back and, you know, her little picture. I don't know how many emails I've gotten when people got theirs and they were like, oh my God, I love the towel first. Like it's beautiful. And second, I'm keeping that tag. That is the most precious thing I've ever seen. We kind of wanted to expand that a little bit, like add a few more, you know, she does the towels and the napkins now. And, you know, add a few more really cool premium products that are like upcycled or recycled that if they're out of stock, they're out of stock. And then you have to wait until they're back in stock. And I just really feel like when you have something like that, people will wait because it's, it's like, oh, I, you know, I, I waited oh, three weeks for this towel because this little girl made it herself. It's really what our brand is about, you know, keeping, it's a family business and keeping the family all involved. I think there's, there's two things that I want to say. One is like, don't apologize for the size you're at. Like it's incredible. And, and, and it's not to be, not to apologize because you can't fulfill it, but then to recognize it is exclusive and then to, to even treat how you sell it that way so that you're an in integrity and the brand is an in integrity and people love it even more. So there's, there's that. And the other one is I, I actually, I would caution against having one of the premium items as part of the subscription. Okay. Like I would, I would explore having the subscription be something that, you know, you can consistently fulfill. Okay. And the premium, maybe the, the, the club gets first dibs at the premium okay. as they get produced, but, but it's not a promise because that, that is another potential bottleneck. But when you begin to expand out the club, then you don't want to have built in other bottleneck pressure points. Like, That's a great idea. I love you know, that. Hurry up and crochet, mom. I mean, you don't want that to be. I know my poor little six-year-old mother <laughs> <laughs> boiling away every day. And come on, mom, I'm going to crack the whip. <laughs> but serve your loyal customers and not lose them to people that are buying just because Jenny McCarthy tweeted it. And they're not really going to come back. I mean, maybe they will. Maybe everyone will love it. But like, you want to reward the people that have been there the whole time and keep yes. them satisfied. Yes. Until I mean, your capacity like, goes up. What I've learned is, and this was through just having a, a marketing and PR background. It was great when Jenny McCarthy tweeted us. That was awesome. The flood of people that went to the website and you know the flood of orders. It was amazing. But our cu customer retention on that one particular tweet wasn't very high. And so many people will go and they'll pay Kim Kardashian a hundred gajillion dollars to say, I love this pencil, buy it. And people will go buy one of those pencils so they can say, I bought one of those pencils Kim Kardashian likes, but they're not going to go back and buy them again and again. I don't want to put a lot of stock into the, I mean, yes, influencers are important. They really are. It's important to have influencers because you will get new customers that you wouldn't have normally had. Um, and you will have retention on some of them, but I really want it more to be my homegrown market where you feel like it's your you fanatical user base. I mean, that, that's yeah. what you need to be catering to. Yeah, and I would love if all those celebrities, you know, if I retain them all as customers, that'd be great. I would love if they would all go online and tweet about it. That would be wonderful. But I have to keep in mind, you know, that these people that when I was nothing, were still my customers. And they were still posting pictures of my products on social media and posting videos of them unboxing and being like, and look at this and look at this. And so, that you know, I have to remember have. that they made my homegrown market. Jenny McCarthy didn't make it. She, she gave us a little boost, but it, they made my homegrown market. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us. I really appreciate it. And thank you guys so much for your time. I appreciate it so much. 
And feel free to reach out, you know, via email if you've got follow-up questions. You know, this is what we try to do is just help help entrepreneurs help each other through sharing these experiences.